Hey, what is up guys? It is your boy Speed here and today we're going to be taking a look at Liquid Koifa's 10-0 Invoker game that is keeping them currently in the major. This was a best of one between them. Oh, and what is this team's name? I'm not going to lie. I don't know. AS Monaco Gambit. They absolutely popped off. His lane was also very difficult. That's what I like about this game. You know, he got last pick counterpicked by this Kunkka. Kunkka is is, you know, infamously known as the Invoker counter. I, I'm sure a lot of us can think back to the TI game where Thompson got crushed by an Invoker. Uh, however, they... Did they win that game? Yeah, I think that was Seb... Uh, I think that was the Seb Axe game. The Seb... All right, we're going to be taking a look at his game. He's playing Exhort here. Goes 10-0 and and has a very simple game plan that you guys can copy in your games as well. And let's get into it. All right, before we do, make sure you guys smash that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We post here daily. And uh, yeah, if you're struggling to gain rank, I mean, have you considered buying a Game Leap sub? Have you? Because I said this in my last video or one of the previous videos, but every single Immortal player has only gotten into Immortal because of a Game Leap sub. It's actually the hidden secret behind all of the success of OG over the last two TIs. Don't believe me? Go DM No Tail. Alright, so as we hop into it, his starting item build is a little bit different. It's consisting of starting tangos. Not starting tangos after the runes, literally starting tangos. You'll notice on most ranged heroes, you typically have two mantles or two circlets. He has opted to skip this and has prioritized getting tangos right away. On top of that, he's also rushing the no recipe right away. A little bit of a difference from your typical ranged starting item build, and I think this mainly comes down to the fact that he's in a pretty hard matchup. He also can get charged by Spirit Breaker. And so at any point in time in the lane, you know, if he drops below half HP, which is relatively common against Kunkka, and he doesn't have Tangos ready to go, there's a very high chance he dies. Now, I don't want to focus on the laning stage too much. My primary focus for this video is going to be on the mid and late game of his gameplay, but I do want to cover a couple of main things for the laning stage that you guys need to implement as well. So in the starting waves, Kunkka is not that hard of a counter to you Yet, I mean, sure, his sword is still annoying. Tidebringer still does quite a bit of damage, but you notice as no one is prepping the range creep to secure it with his W, Koifa is hitting him a lot. So in any melee matchup, you really want to try to do this where you hit, move back, hit, move back. I'm going to show it to you guys one more time so you can see what I'm saying. And what this does, this will allow you to hit them without tanking way too much damage from creeps. And so as we see here, hit, move back, hit, move back. Hit, move to the side. In that case, he didn't really move back, but he moved to the side. It's kind of a rinse repeat. Every single auto attack he threw, he moved back. And no, that's not a coincidence. This is not me nitpicking. This is literally something if you pay attention to any hero, really, that auto attacks, they'll basically all do this unless the trade is insanely favorable or they just don't care about the creeps. Maybe they're a timber saw. And the second thing and last thing I want to mention in the laning stage that a lot of people forget to do is switch to Quas in downtime. For instance, right here as he backs up, he even does be a little bit slow on it, I'll be honest. Koifa's got a little bit of room to improve, but hey, we all forget to do these things perfectly, right? After all, he's still a human. But what I'm saying here is that after he goes on this Kunkka and there's clearly no more chase potential, the chase is done. He's not getting any more auto attacks in. He wants to instantly switch to Quas. Now, I think his focus was on the Q, Right, putting the second point in the queue to obviously triple the HP regen, which is quite important. Uh, but yeah, after that, you really want to switch to Quas immediately, right, to get that regen going. And you might be saying, oh, Speed, that's so obvious. But a lot of people who aren't Invoker spammers don't know this, or at the minimum, you don't do it enough as you need to. In this matchup, as I said, it's very easy for him to die if he makes only a few misplays. This would be considered a misplay if he forgets to switch the Quas. And just as a small example of this, let's take a look at this lane and just pay attention to his orbs, right? Now he's on Exhort and goes for the Deny, right? No Deny, nothing to get up, goes to Quas. Might go for this, uh, this Deny coming up here, kind of switches back to Exhort. It's like, all right, I'll trade with the Kunkka, right? Exhort to trade, range creep on Exhort, doesn't get it, backs up to Ida Tango, back to Quas. You see what I'm saying? It's Changing, 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 all while focusing on the creeps. This is why Dota is such a hard game, because you have to do all this at the same time. All right, skipping ahead to the mid game, getting into the seven minute mark here. We're going to talk about the first time when he starts jungling. Well, it's the seven minute mark, which <laughs> which I said, and he's going to be going for Treads Trums here. If you play Exhort Invoker, I honestly do think that this is the way to go. I think Midas is just 
Honestly, number one, Midas doesn't even make you farm that much faster. Like, Treads give you more damage anyway, which technically makes you kill more creeps, which gives you more XP, so like, Midas doesn't help you with that. And in the multiple scenarios where you get ganked in a lot of your pubs, having Treads are obviously going to keep you alive significantly more often than a Midas will. That's very, very obvious. But yeah, just when you're playing Exhort Invoker, I highly recommend going this build. It just kind of lets you do what you need much better than a Midas, and I think the Midas, you know, I don't know, that item is just, unless you're playing Arc Warden, that item is very questionable. Other than that, you're going to notice he doesn't spend any time really pushing any towers. When his team gets ganked in the side lanes, he's not going to bother, like, pushing mid or anything like that. And the reason being is the enemy team just has too much catch. Even if he goes mid and they were all top, they could easily just charge him, TP in with Kunkka, and he's dead. And so he's going to be playing a very defensive game. On top of that, when he sees the enemy team smoke, he's not even going to push in the mid wave because he's prioritizing keeping himself alive rather than optimizing farm. And in high MMR games or games where the enemy team is putting a lot of pressure, it's important that you have patience and play in the trees. This applies to every core role in every scenario where you're getting ganked or you think you might get ganked. And so instead, he spawns his Forge Spirit to kind of scout things out. This tells the enemy team that, hey, we kind of know what you're doing. You can show now and will go back to farming, and that's exactly what he does. They also do sort of go for a Kunkka kill, probably wouldn't have happened even if they did connect, but it will at least allow them to scare off the Kunkka and for Koifa to farm up the mid wave. Now after that, we see his first rotation of the game, and this is why the, the drums plus one plus no plus treads build is much better than any Midas, because with Midas, yeah, he could cast his spells here, but he'd be so slow that he would never really be able to get in position or do any damage with auto attacks, but when you're Exhort with Treads, you can actually show up to fights and do a lot of damage. On top of that, Exhort Invoker right now has this capability to have two Forge Spirits early into the game, around minute 9, minute 10, once he hits level 8. Once you have 4 points in Quas and 4 points in Exhort, you get two Forge Spirits, and this allows you to take these early game fights, and that's what he's going to do. Now as this fight breaks out, obviously he's just going to walk right in. Why is that obvious? Well, <laughs> it's because the Sand King is getting focused. When you're playing Invoker, you don't want to go in first, right? You want to be the guy who responds late to the fights, who cleans up and comes in with a Cold Snap Sunstrike combo to finish off a kill, and that's literally what we see here, and it's a great execution of that. He kites out, he's very nervous of getting caught in the AoE, right? Invoker and Squishy Cores in general do not want to get caught in the AoE, so he's a little bit hesitant, but quickly realizes that, okay, we're under the tower, they're in a sandstorm, they're overcommitting pretty hard, my Willow can W in, and they secure a big kill onto no one's Kunkka. And right after the fight ends, he's immediately back into the jungle and is going to jungle all the way throughout it. And this is exactly how you want to play Invoker. Show up to dives, clean through the jungle, and rinse for Pete. Anything else from the research that I've done, it just generally doesn't work. When you're playing Exhort Invoker, if you just gang too much, you typically won't have enough CS. You'll end up dying in a fight because your hero just doesn't have good survivability, right? A hero like AA or Enigma or Kunkka are gonna get on top of you and likely kill you if you become too predictable. So don't be predictable, stay out of vision, and show up to fights that have already developed. And I guess just as like a, like a side piece of information, this generally applies to really any sort of hero that's like this. For instance, a couple of good examples, I would say Storm is sort of like this, Pugna is sort of like this, Skywrath if you happen to play a mid, Tinker to a large extent, you know, really any of the mid squishy heroes that die if they get gone on very easily. The next thing I'd like to ask you is, uh, I guess is a little bit of trivia. What are the two most important spells in this current meta of Invoker? What are the two spells you will likely be using the most when it comes to the mid game? All right, you got your answer? I don't care. <laughs> the two most important ones are Alacrity and Forge Spirit by quite a large margin because you're going to be spending the most of the time farming. So if you find yourself spamming Sunstrikes 24-7 and fights aren't happening 24-7, there's a problem. Now, yeah, if your team is going for pickoffs like 90% of the game and it just happens to be one of those pubs, you should be casting Sunstrikes 24-7. But in a match like this, when the game is pretty passive, the game is literally 1-5 to five after 16 minutes, which is just hilarious, you want to be casting Four Spirits and Alacrity by far the most. Other than that, number three is easily Sunstrike, just because the best way to participate in fights as Invoker is either side lane pickoffs that you're in, or side lane pickoffs that involve your stun heroes. Next up, we're going to look at maybe the most important engagement of this entire match that Koifa expertly executes on. Alright, so as it breaks out, they're going to be going on a Wraith King, right? They're kind of waiting in the creep wave, pushing it out with four spirits. 
It's very common when you're playing Exhort and Invoker that you actually push out the dead lane, well, because you have Alacrity Forge Spirits, and that's exactly what they're doing. On top of that, I love this play that they make. They understand that, really, with the combination of Taiga's Dark Willow, which is currently level 13, pretty insane how high level he actually is, and Invoker, they can kill basically anyone. Now, Wraith King ends up TPN, which is a bit, of, bit rough, right? It's a bit rough, because if you go on him, obviously the enemy team's gonna respond. So let's see how they execute on that. That's the information you have to consider. Because it's so close to their tier 1 tower, and you're going on a Wraith King with two lives, you have to be very careful about how you execute it, and you constantly have to kite back. And so that's exactly what we're going to see them do, which is the most important part here. This is understanding matchups in the mid-game. Matchups go all the way into the mid-game. I think a lot of the time when people think about matchups, they think about it from a laning stage perspective. But yeah, as they go in, they immediately expect the charge to come out, and that's why they kite out. That's exactly what we see. They go in, he was going to get Spirit Breaker ulti, so he obviously has to blink out. Realizes he's very low mana, pops his clarity, going to switch the wand in. Very nicely done. Knows he can't really help Taiga yet, but as his Sand King TPs in, he's immediately going to invoke Sunstrike, and they kite out the Wraith King's first life. This is ridiculously good synergy by, by Liquid, and exactly how they want to start the fight. They want to burst Wraith King without putting anyone besides the Sand King a melee range. Very often in pubs, what do people do wrong? They find themselves on Invoker or Willow killing a Wraith King, but they're in melee range, so they get slowed for whatever it is, 3-4 seconds by like 70%. I don't even know what the numbers are, but it feels like that. It's probably about that. And then they die right afterwards, and obviously that's not too worth it. It's a large reason why Wraith King has such a high win rate in low Mar pubs. People don't kite out. And so instead, you're going to see him actually kite out here. He knows by clicking, obviously, Wraith King's items, there is no BKB yet. And so whatever he casts on him is basically going to hit. I think they also don't have a 4 staff or anything like that. So the Wraith King is just stuck. It is what it is, you know, <laughs> and so it's a great combo, right? Nice little cold snap into the meteor combo, and he's absolutely dead. A beautifully played fight by Liquid that puts none of their squishy heroes in danger. Eventually, they try to go in on the enemy team, but uh, yeah, it's simply not going to be enough, and they take a very convincing fight that puts them up about 3,000 net worth. After that, they do what? Oh, they don't hit the top tier 2 tower. Are you serious? Are, are you telling me that? You tell me that you don't have to push a tier 2 tower immediately after clearing a creep wave? That's right. <laughs> nah, but in all seriousness, guys, in your pubs, like, this happens all the time. People clean up a fight, they're like, Oh, we have a numbers advantage, push a tower. Nine times out of ten, once the game goes past a minute 20 to 25, depending on how good your team is at roaching, right? Almost every single team comp can roach at minute 25. There's very little exceptions to that. I mean, there's a few. Like, let's see if, like, Ricky Carey and... Pugna mid, I don't know, even then you could probably make it work, <laughs> like, that's the thing, uh, so yeah, they're gonna tank it up, secure the Roshan, they do get AA blasted, which is, that's yeah, a bit scary, right, gotta be a little bit careful, as BKB is on cooldown, but they assume they have enough time, that is true, and they get a big Aegis kill, then he blinks up the high ground, which honestly I thought was a bit dangerous, but I guess he's just assuming that they're gonna dodge them, because they're just afraid of them. The last and final thing I'd like to discuss, besides the ending fight, of this game is how they play the map before they end the game. What do they do before they decide to try to go high ground? And that's very hard to know in Dota. It's like the hardest thing, but anytime you build up a lead, you want to do what Koifa and the Io and the Sand King are about to do. They know they have a lot of pickoff. They have a lot of very mobile heroes. Invoker's pretty fast at this point in the game. Io is, has Relocate. The Sand King has Boots of Travels. They're a very fast team comp. And so when you're this far ahead, it's actually totally fine to split up. Especially when you have supports like Willow and Abaddon, who can afford to play alone, you really have this luxury of splitting up the map and constantly looking for pickoffs. And that's what we see here, right? The Abaddon is showing mid, and typically for your average support, if everyone TP's bottom and the Abaddon's mid, he's guaranteed dead, but, you know, the enemy team doesn't really want to go on Abaddon, that's not too fun, and so they TP in, they kill off the Spear Breaker, then they obviously see the Wraith King, they're gonna kick him out, and they're gonna constantly force the enemy team back. Then they see this Kunkka top, knowing that the Kunkka's top, they're gonna, you know, mess with the Wraith King a little bit. Do they end up killing him here? Yeah, they do. They completely cut out this Wraith King, and uh, it's just masterful play, right? The reason why it's masterful play is because they're basically reading the enemy team super hard. They know when they go for the Spirit Breaker kill here, right? So, as they run bottom, what is that gonna signal to the enemy team? If, if you go bottom, it tells the enemy team they can go mid or top. But then, if they go mid or top, you can find them mid or top, <laughs> right? It's an obvious, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple concept, it just requires very quick action to get it done, and you have to be further enough ahead 
where lingering heroes like a Willow and an Abaddon is not a problem. So obviously their team comp is designed to be able to do this like heavy pickoff sort of play, right? Where they split up the lanes. And a lot of team comps can do this, especially when you begin to build up a lead. All right, and let's take a look at the last fight of the game. His execution is going to be very simple this fight. Very, very simple. It's just going to include essentially waiting for a Sanking Stun or waiting for a Black Hole. The reason why Black Hole is he can actually cancel Black Hole, even B BKB Black Hole, with a Refresher Cataclysm combo. He can just explode the Enigma through the BKB, nullifying that. And so, yeah, he just waits for them to go in. We see exactly that, a Sanking Initiation. The Black Hole comes out. He drops the combo. It does exactly what you would expect it to do. Oh my god. <laughs> that is brutal. Let's watch that again. My god, that is just... Ugh, it's just dirty. It's really dirty. Yep, Black Hole comes out. <laughs> oh my god. Oh god. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's gonna be the end of the game. They tried their best, but it wasn't enough. Alright, thank you guys so much for watching this. If you enjoyed, smash that like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this one. And of course, subscribe to Game Leap for more videos like this one and even better videos than this one. But alright, I'll see you there and I'm out. Peace. And that's all, but remember, before you leave, come on, before you tune out, subscribe to the Game Leap website where we are going to help you get to the next rank. If you're stuck, click the link down below, and I'm out. Peace.